Our opening hymn is number 2236, Gather Us In, and we'll sing stanzas one, two, and four. away. See in this space our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of Please remain standing and join me in our call to work, call, opening prayer, please. Uh, living God, you gave us your son to be our light and our salvation. Jesus called his disciples to be fishers of people. Give us the courage to be disciples and make disciples, that our lives may bear witness to the good news of your kingdom at hand and our vocations may serve to draw people to your salvation. By the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated. Our prayer for illumination today. Enlightening God, illumine our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read, read and your word are proclaimed, our eyes may be opened, our ears may hear your call, and our hearts may know the joy of your salvation. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for today is from Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 4. 
hear the word of the Lord. But there will be gloom for those who are in anguish. In the former time, he brought them into contempt, the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians 1. Verses 10 to 18. So let me just, there we go. Perfect. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you may be, must be in agreement and, you, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or where were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Caius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness for those who perish. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's, it's, oh, seems like this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Audio settings. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Sound set. Do that sound settings right there. Mm -hmm. You can't hear it. Your speakers. So, so.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and sh in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Pray with me, please. God of power, by your Holy Spirit, grant us eyes to see, ears to, see, to hear, and hearts that are open to the word you have for us this day. Amen. As Christians, we often refer to ourselves as the body of Christ. We say things like, I might just be the, the pinky toe on the body of Christ, but I'm wiggling with all my might. We grant ourselves and others individual autonomy, but as Christians, we know that we also belong to the body of believers. We all have different talents, and abilities on purpose, by the grace of God, so that by combining our different talents and abilities, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, as this body of Christians called Bethany Church, we are a body politic. We are a group of people who gather together to accomplish things we couldn't do individually. We meet together and decide on our goals and how we will accomplish them. We prioritize our missions and ministries. We do these things within the confines of the polity of the United Methodist Church, which is outlined in glorious detail in our Book of Discipline. Simply put, we agree to share our life in the universal body of Christ as members of this Bethany UMC body of Christ, a body politic. How? 
how we share our life together within our UMC polity is our politics. Jesus said that where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And as anyone who has ever been married will testify, where two or more are gathered, we need house rules, chore charts, policies, mutual agreements as to how we will behave with each other and what we can expect from each other. And that's what politics is working out how we agree to share life together. Recent disaffiliations have shown us that some of our friends and colleagues have decided that they no longer agree to share a life of ministry in Jesus Christ with us. It's been a painful season, heartbreaking. And sadly, there are more disaffiliations to come. But you know, differences of opinion where two or, more, two or more are gathered are as old as humanity. That's why we need Jesus in our midst when two or more are gathered. And as today's epistle makes clear, Differences of belief and practice began springing up in the earliest Christian gatherings. The church in Corinth was trying to do an amazing thing. They were trying to support one another as they grew in the love and knowledge of Jesus Christ in a wildly mixed bag of humans people who previously were rarely in one another's company, men and women who were neither married nor members of the same family, free people and those who were indentured, the Jews who had decided to follow Jesus and the Goyim, literally everyone else from every nation speaking whatever language. People who had been worshiping the little G gods and goddesses of mythology until the moment they were convicted in the word of Christ. Should we be surprised that they struggled to come to a mutual understanding of how to share their faith life together? How could men and women Jew and Gentile, slave and free, actually be equals in the body of Christ. Well, in his letter, Paul called them out, reprimanding them for lording it over one another. I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas. Friends, how is that any different from I'm Catholic, I'm Greek Orthodox, I'm United Methodist, or I'm Global Methodist. How is it any different from I'm a conservative Christian or I'm a liberal Christian? It's not. We too are convicted by our divisiveness. Apparently, some Christians uh, threw down the ace card, I belong to Christ. Well, we know those types still exist today. My Christianity is purer, better, higher than yours. To which Paul says, has Christ been divided? We may and do carve out our little kingdoms any way we please, but if we imagine we are more beloved by, Christ, by God in Christ than other people, we do not have the love of Jesus in us. Let me say that again. If we imagine we are beloved by God in Christ more than other people, we do not have the love of Jesus in us. 
And when we looked at John's gospel last week, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, look, there he is, the Messiah. And that's when Andrew and his brother Simon began to follow Jesus. But here in Matthew's gospel, Matthew says that it was not until after John was arrested that Jesus began his ministry. And he began it by saying exactly the same thing that John had said. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. Turn away from the way you have been living. Turn and seek the kingdom of heaven. Now, a kingdom is a political entity. It is the ultimate in top-down leadership. The king is the final word. But Jesus did not do power over, except to heal and welcome. He didn't preach a power over top-down kingdom. In fact, despite what our English translations say, Jesus didn't actually talk about a kingdom at all, even the kingdom of heaven. I'm sure you have been exposed to, at some time or another, a change to that word, the kingdom of God. Kingdom without the G, kingdom. Plenty of people roll their eyes at the use of the word or dismiss it altogether as politically correct gobbledygook. Whether it's kingdom or kingdom, the problem is one of translation. You know how I love this stuff. For the next little bit, I'm indebted to, probably won't say it correctly, Dear Mood Omerchu and his article, Christian Life, Essay 2, from his own website. And in it, Omerchu references John Dominic Crossan's book, The Historical Jesus, and N.T. Wright's The Victory of God, among others. Now, the English word kingdom is masculine. Kings are men. If it was a queendom, we would, ha we would know that was a woman. Realm, or maybe democracy, might come closer to a non-gendered English word for the way a heaven-oriented group of people would live together. But the Greek word used there is basileia, and that's a feminine word. Hebrew and Aramaic words that would be translated kingdom were also feminine. Now, those of you who excelled in foreign languages, I am not one of you, uh, will remember some English nouns like paper, pencil, table, are gendered in other languages. Table, for example, un tableau in French, masculine. La Mesa in Spanish, feminine. There's no gender-related reason for a table to be masculine or feminine, but the nature of some languages is such that inanimate, non-gendered objects are gendered words which require gendered pronouns, articles, adjectives, etc. And such is the case with the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic words that we have translated into English as kingdom. Scholars have known for a long time that kingdom of heaven doesn't quite capture Jesus' description of God's radical community of love and forgiveness. But the influence of the dominant culture with its top-down leadership made kingdom the logical choice, the one that people would relate to more easily. Top-down leadership is also consistent with the idea of the body of Christ with Jesus as its head. So in the historical Jesus, John Dominic Crossan suggested an alternative translation of kingdom of heaven. He called it the companionship of empowerment. Think about that for a minute. The companionship of empowerment. Jesus used his power to help, heal, listen, teach, 
forgive, and welcome. He used his infinite power to serve, and particularly to serve the hurting and powerless, forgotten and abandoned. Jesus said he came that we may have life and have it abundantly. He came to bring good news to the poor and sight to the blind. He came to show us a better way to live, a more excellent way to share life together. Throughout the Bible, in the Old and New Testaments, God is shown to have a tender heart for the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the enslaved. And it doesn't matter if we are enslaved by poor working conditions or poor relationships. It doesn't matter if we have poor health or poor pockets. It doesn't matter how we are oppressed or by whom. God's plan for all of us is to be liberated, freed, to have life and to have it abundantly. And y'all, the way we work that out is political. And I don't mean Republican or Democrat kingdoms or democracies. I mean the politics of Jesus Christ. How we live the love of God in our shared life together. Loving God and loving our neighbors, whoever they are, whatever condition they're in, sinners and saints. Wanting for all of our neighbors what we ourselves want to have or hope to keep. A safe place to live and enough food to keep a body alive. Learning to love our neighbors as we do ourselves means working to make sure enough, enough is possible for all God's children. I'm sure I've used this example before, but it's so simple I keep returning to it. Whenever we have a community meal at the church, and the children or teens wolf down their food and then make a move to try to hurry back for seconds, what do we say? Wait, right? Wait until everyone gets a first serving before you go back for seconds. Why can't we apply that simple rule to economics? Shouldn't we insist that everyone have the basics? Healthy food and safe drinking water, safe housing, accessible medical care, probably adequate technology and internet, and reliable transportation. I mean, our basic needs, shouldn't everyone have the basics before anyone rewards themselves with money to buy themselves a gold-plated toilet or build themselves a rocket to the moon? Because that kind of wealth always comes from suppressing the wages of the workers at the bottom of the company those whose jobs secure the basic needs of the company. In the companionship of empowerment, everyone has something useful to do, and if they don't, the community supports them. Empowering everyone to discover and do what God has uniquely created them to do naturally results in a community that respects and appreciates one another's gifts, what they contribute. Living out the companionship of empowerment brings about justice for all people, which leads to peace on earth. Jesus didn't come to earth to be our king. Jesus humbled himself and became human to show us how to love 
heal, welcome, and feed one another in body, mind, and spirit. He came to show us a more excellent way, his way, to love one another and live together in peace. Everything Jesus teaches us is about how to live together in loving kindness as God intended. That is the politics of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Oh, let's see, what do I do with it? Oh. I don't have my bulletin, but we're going to sing the next hymn, whatever it is. Please stand, <laughs> you are able. <laughs> turn with me in your hymnals to 884 as we confess together the Korean affirmation of faith, Korean Methodist statement of faith. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God 
as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to a time of sharing our joys and concerns. Are there folks we want to lift up this time? Okay. I have a joy. Oh, I have a new great grandson born on Tuesday. Congratulations. Congratulations. New That's great special. grandson. That special. That awesome. We want to remember um, Bunny and George and Ava and Ralph. And if I start going through too much of the list, I, I will leave a lot of people off. So um, we know of folks in our community who are struggling with health concerns. Um, and so we want to remember all of those folks. Um, we want to remember the latest victims of gun violence in California where there was a shooting last night where people were celebrating the Chinese New Year. Um, there are many places where God's love and a community that respects one another because Jesus tells us to. We lost, um, in December, we lost a uh, very respected doctor uh, here in uh, Durham. Uh, his name is uh, William Vance Singletary. Uh, so for their family, uh, he is a very special man. I had the privilege of meeting him once. Uh, and uh, what a doctor. Uh, he never retired. He was 73 when he passed. Mm. Uh, a very special man, humble and born to be a doctor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please think of his family uh, in this time. Sure. Yeah, it's wonderful when you discover your gift and are able to do it. <laughs> um, are there others? Let us go to God in prayer. God of loving kindness, God of mercy and forgiveness, we are humbled to come before you knowing ourselves as we do, knowing our own sin. It is humbling to come before you and know that you long for our heart. As broken as we might be, you long to be in relationship with us. You long to heal us. You long to listen to our prayers. You desire us far more than we desire you. So we come to you with humble hearts asking that you will Bless us with your wisdom, with your grace, mercy, and forgiveness. We pray that you will pour out your healing spirit on those we've named. Pour out your comfort upon those who are suffering shock, loss, injury, Lord, we ask that you would grant us your spirit 
that we may speak your word of healing, your word of welcome, your word of forgiveness into the lives of those we meet, those who need to hear that good word from you. Lord, we offer ourselves as vessels to be used to do your will upon the earth. We pray for our church, this faith community, all of the faith communities that surround us, for your church in the world, for our governments, for our business leaders. We pray that your humble servant leadership may rest upon them and they may be guided to make decisions that lead to peace, that lead to prosperity for all people, that put an end to hunger and strife. We pray for humility, for the humility of Jesus, that we might become a community of servant leaders. We pray all of this in the powerful name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God, the source of freedom and forgiveness. Try in God, one in three, three in one. We confess that we have not been faithful to you in our thoughts and actions. We have been selfish in our desires and quarrelsome in our relationships. We have allowed fear to divide us from those who seem different, who are in fact different in body, language, or experience of the world. We have let distrust of all things other separate us from our brothers and sisters. Forgive us, Lord. Shine your light into our darkened hearts. Save us from our divisive ways. Unite us in the same mind as Jesus Christ so that we may become peacemakers who live in peace with each other by creating a peaceable body politic for each other. Empower us to live in your triune unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God offers forgiveness to all. Let us repent, turning away from self-seeking and toward God's lavish love and forgiveness. Let us trust in God, who has broken our indebtedness to sin and covers us in mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you now, as forgiven and reconciled people, to offer yourselves your tithes and offerings to God to bless and distribute for the healing of the world.
blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit. God, we give you thanks for the generosity of this congregation. We give you thanks for the gifts of our lives that we share with you through this church. We pray that you will bless our generosity of spirit and of pocketbook, that your will may truly come upon the earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 557, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. May the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest upon you and abide within you this day and every day. And may you go forth from this place, nurtured in your spirit, to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.